Let's talk about the principle of law and how it is a failed method for creating behavior. Because it's something that I notice is that even amongst those of free grace, they still don't really seem to believe that law is a failure as a general principle. And so they end up with some very confused ideas like basically grace is the power to keep the law. Um, they never really seem to want to entirely throw out the law or to completely abolish it as a functioning means for producing an outcome. So first let's understand what the principle of law is because generally speaking I think in most cases especially in current times and, and in our culture the creation or institution of law is generally has a positive intention so it's not designed to do things that are harmful it's designed to produce a functioning society so what I'm saying is that the goal of producing a law is noble it's reasonable it's something I'm on board with so what we're not we're not talking about a difference between a dysfunctional society and a functional society we're talking about how do we go about creating that and what my assertion is is that law is a dysfunctional way to try and produce a functional society it's a failed means of producing unintended behavior and one of the reasons is because what law is is it's an attempt to coerce people into doing things that they don't want to do or not doing things that they do want to do so you're already at the point at which you have a struggle against what people are feeling naturally inclined to do so then to create those prohibitions and so forth is going to ultimately create a pushback where at some point people are going to say we've had enough of you telling us what to do and how to live our lives because what you've never done is address the root cause you've never gotten to the foundation of the problem you've never cut it out by the root and transformed the minds and hearts of people so it's like I mentioned that no matter how many times you tell somebody to say thank you you can't cause them to become thankful there's no number of times that you say thank thank you that transforms your heart into one of gratitude at best you produce a person who says thank you at in an appropriate fashion but you can't actually cause the heart of gratitude by produce by this behavioral technique so it doesn't work from outside in it has to work from inside out which is what it means that you know if righteousness can come by the law you know the, the law never produced righteousness because the law doesn't produce that heart change at best the law produces a behavioral change and that's the thing is even when it comes to producing a behavioral change the law is a failed method so what law is is that it is a system where it tries to coerce your behavior either by causing you to do things you don't want to do or abstain from things you do want to do and it uses a promise of reward and most especially really a threat of punishment based on keeping those rules or not so whatever the rules are whatever it is that you're supposed to do or not supposed to do how well you comply with that how well you keep that is going to determine whether you receive those rewards or those punishments 
So primarily, in, in most cases, law threatens to punish you for not complying. You break the law, you have a punishment. You break the rules, there's a punishment. Um, to some extent, it might be based on reward. Uh, I've heard people say, you know, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. That's essentially the principle behind a law technique. And so I'm in favor of a functional society. I want companies that don't dump I don't want companies that dump toxins into the water supply. I don't want people driving in a way that endangers others. You know, I'm just as much for a functional society as anybody else is, but I disagree with the method of law being the means by which you produce that. And so let's discuss that because it's kind of a philosophical understanding to get to the root of this, to understand that when you're attempting to coerce behavior by threatening to punish someone, you're swimming upstream and you've essentially already failed in, all along in the process. You've had this opportunity before getting to that point to undermine the, the process and to produce the outcome. And yet now you're waiting for when you're working against what somebody wants. So the first principle of understanding what law is all about is that it's working against what people feel naturally inclined to do. So what you have is you have people doing things that they shouldn't be doing or that your society says shouldn't be doing or by whatever standard it is, whether it's something that really they shouldn't be doing, like poisoning the water supply, that's unhealthy for a great multitude of people, or it's just maybe a more personal thing, like don't bite your nails, um, whatever it is there's something that you're fighting against what they feel naturally inclined to do. So if we put this into a religious perspective, you could say like tithing. So you don't want to tithe and your denomination wants you to pay a tithe of 10% off the top. And so you say, you know, that's not consistent with what I want to do. I want to pay my bills. So now you have your denomination attempting to persuade you that if you pay them 10% off the top, God will make sure you're capable of paying your bills. And then when that doesn't work out, somehow there's something that you're at fault for. Probably most notably to jump to an immediate conclusion is, well, your giving is not with a cheerful heart. You're just giving begrudgingly in order to comply with the rules. Well, of course you are because there's a law that says you have to. There's a promise of reward and a threat of punishment for compliance. Or your denomination might say to abstain from drinking or whatever other mind-altering substances. You know, don't drink. And so then there might be the threat of eternal conscious torment after you die, or it might be even a real-world, denominationally imposed sanction. Like, I, I know a guy who left the Amish because every time he participated in certain behaviors, then he had to get in front of the whole congregation and he had to, quote, repent, end quote, as they misdefine it, um, which is that he had to be very sorrowful for what he did and plead and beg forgiveness and promise not to do it anymore. And he said... I thought this was great. He said, I don't need to be Amish to go to heaven. <laughs> I thought that was great. So he he left that. But the point is that the denomination might have some kind of actual sanctions against the behavior. So there's a promise of reward and a threat of punishment to force you into doing things you don't want to do and prevent you from doing things that you do want to do. And law is a failed principle for producing this because it's not addressing the root cause. It's not addressing the, the issue that underlies that. 
it's only dealing with the final outcome of behavior itself. And it's not concerned at all with the... Well, it is, because it's a general principle that's imposed because we want well-being, we want functional society. But it ends up that it doesn't care about the well-being of an individual, only that person's compliance to the whatever the behavior is. So if I were to say, I don't like you biting your nails, so I'm going to try and create a law that you don't bite your nails. So what I'm saying is that the important thing to me is that you don't bite your nails. I'm not concerned with what's underlying that. And I'm thinking, you know, actually there was this, I think it was a show called The Story of God with Morgan Freeman, but there was a thing that they had that they had children playing this game. And so what they, they told this, this group of children, they were filming the whole thing. And they said, uh, if you, they, okay. So they had a dartboard. It was, it was like, but it was Velcro. So it was like Velcro balls instead of darts. It was like the, uh, child safe version of darts, I guess. So they said, if you get the balls on this board and score high enough, you'll get a special prize. And so then they had a line of tape several feet from the board. And they said, you have to stand behind this line to throw the balls at the board. And they said, oh, by the way, you need to stand backwards and throw them over your shoulder behind you. So I'll withhold my my assessment of things here first. I'll just describe everything that happened. So what they did was the rule was score high enough, you get a prize. Stand behind this line and throw them backwards over your shoulder. Now, somebody who's an adult that trained might be able to get pretty good at this and pretty reliably hit the target. For these young, small children, basically, this was an impossibility. Out of 100 children, they might get one that one time had enough dumb luck to hit the target. But that was the rules of the game. So what happened was the children would be left alone in the room one by one and they'd look around they'd see that nobody was looking and they'd walk up to the board and they'd stick the balls up on the board one by one so they solved the problem oh, sorry I'm, I'm almost getting into my own interpretation here I want to tell you what, what they presented so one by one each child basically walked up to the board and stuck the balls on it yay prize for me then they took the same children and they said they put a chair in the room and they said there's this nice invisible princess sitting in this chair and she's going to watch you play the game now they never threatened them with a punishment or anything like this they just said that they were they just indicated to the children basically that they were being watched so now at this point when they left the room the children would investigate one girl, I even remember, she was like even putting her hand down on the chair like, I don't feel anybody here. They all generally seemed to ultimately conclude that there was in fact someone there even though they couldn't perceive it. Um, even when they couldn't feel anybody or hear anybody or see anybody, they concluded that there was a princess watching them. And one by one, they stood behind the line and tried to throw the ball over their shoulder behind them. And they all failed to hit the board. So the way the show presented this, they concluded that this is the way they presented it. They said that the children stopped cheating when they thought they were being watched. And I was, the whole thing, just even the way it was presented kind of appalled me. Because here's, here's the way I interpreted it. Okay, so first of all, they had an arbitrary prize that they... Basically, they, they produced in the children a sense that they needed something they didn't know they needed until they were told they needed it. Which is... That's something all by itself. <laughs> that's something significant right there to... 
not know that you need something until someone says, oh, hey, by the way, I've got a special prize for you if you do this. So up until that moment, they, they had no sense that they're needing something. But now they have a need. So a, an arbitrary need was created, something that wasn't there before. And that mostly applies to this situation. Um, but then also they created rules that were kind of arbitrary. Uh, and really, actually, the, the rules were intended to produce failure. That was the whole point of them. The, the rules were intended to produce failure. Um, so it was kind of ri it was rigged so that they would fail to achieve solving a problem that they didn't know they had until they showed up there. And that just like even ponder that by itself. There's so much in life and society that is set up that way. And I just, I kind of think of like religion, like, okay, here's this problem you have and here's the solution. Oh, by the way, it's impossible. You can't actually solve your problem. That sounds like religion to me to invent a problem that didn't exist and then tell you, you can't solve it. Um, that sounds like exactly like religion to me, but anyway, not all problems as it pertains to law are contrived and invented and phony, you know, again, going back to polluting the water supply is a real problem that exists. That's not something that wasn't there until I invented a, a need that's real. Um, people driving in a way that doesn't endanger others is a real issue. That's not contrived and invented. Whether you need the new iPhone is contrived and invented, but plenty of these things are real. They're actual issues that need to be addressed. They're things that are important. Um, people do need a place to live. People need access to medical care. There's all kinds of things that are real problems. And so I don't want to suggest that all problems are invented. Um, but in this case, it was an invented problem. It was completely contrived. They had, they showed up. They didn't know there was a problem until they were told they could get a prize. And then they were told to try and earn that prize through a means that was impossible for them. They had no ability to score those balls stick, sticking them to the board. So what I saw was that uh, initially they looked around, they saw nobody was there, and they walked up and they solved their problem. So what I saw was creative solutions that solved a problem. And then they were told that somebody was watching them. And now the priority shifted from how do I solve my problem to how do I keep the rules? And in this case, there are arbitrary rules too. But their priority stopped being how do I solve the problem? That's, I, I'm pausing here because that's important. When you've prioritized keeping the rules, now suddenly you're not focused on solving the problem and you've now flipped around the whole methodology you, you've flipped it upside down which is why jesus said like you know you're so concerned with keeping rules but you don't think that it's okay for starving people to eat on saturday like they didn't think that the the people and their problem and the solution to that problem was more important than their arbitrary rule of don't t don't don't harvest on Saturday was their rule basically, and so if you went through the field getting the food that you needed to eat on Saturday, well that's a problem because the rule was more important than the solution to the problem, which is people are starving to death. And so Jesus said, you've got your priorities out of alignment here. You think the rule is more important than the, than the solution. And yet there was a, a 
there was a part of the law that said you leave the corners of the field unplowed so that these people could eat. So the law actually addressed that one, but they took another piece of the law and elevated it above that and said, no, you don't do it on Saturday. And he said, so what we could call this, we could call this the letter versus the spirit. The spirit of the law, going back, a law is, is, is created because we want to create a functional society. So the spirit of the law is that we want a clean water supply. The spirit of the law is that we want people driving responsibly. The spirit of the law is that we want to provide for people in need. The spirit of the law is, is a good intention. But the letter of the law gets elevated to a point where the rule becomes more important than the individual. And the rule and the keeping of that rule becomes more important than solving problems. So now these children thought that solving the problem that they were presented with was not important. But what was important was compliance with the rule. And this is the kind of problem that we get. Like we, we have people joining gangs because they see a problem that they don't think they're going to be able to solve. And it's just like the children. I didn't think they were cheating. I had no interpretation that they were cheating. My interpretation was that they solved a problem. See, it was a very legalist interpretation to say that they were cheating. They weren't cheating. They were solving a problem that they were presented with. And they decided that their solution to their problem was more important than these arbitrary rules that they were given. And so even if those rules are good rules or valuable rules or beneficial rules, this is what we see with people joining gangs. They decide that their problem is not going to be solved by following the rules. And the solution to their problem is more important than the rules that are being imposed upon them. This is the kind of pushback you get. So I, ha I live in a neighborhood where I think I have no possibility, and this even ties in with, with an arbitrary... Uh, artificial uh, false understanding of what's going to make you happy. So that gets tied into it too. We, we could address what is it that they even really need. And so they might have some artificial things there that need to be addressed as far as what is actually going to make life worth living. But they don't think that the rules are going to be of benefit to them. So now the rules get set aside. And what, what's important is the solution of the problem. So they see the gang as a solution to their problem, just as the children saw walking up to the board and sticking the balls to it as a solution to their problem. And so the question is, wh what can we do to put the focus on the solution to the problem? And what are the rules doing that is preventing that from happening? So, and to what extent is it even an invented need? You know, maybe, maybe we don't need that prize. Or maybe we could move that line forward. Or maybe we could reward the children for following the rule rather than hitting the target. I mean, there's so many different things that you could think about with this illustration of... What is it that you're actually making important? What's important? To the children, what was important initially was getting the prize. What was initially, subsequently, was following the rules. So what's the, what's the thing that was actually important? Following the rules, getting the prize, having the balls on the target? What, uh, you know, what exactly could change in order to improve the outcome? But the whole thing was invented in a way that was intended to produce failure. The whole goal was to make the children, quote, cheat, end quote, and then to frustrate them. I would love to have had a, a talk about what kind of frustration they felt that now that they were presented with this idea that they needed to win this prize, and then they were presented with an, a, a means of attaining it that was impossible. I, I would just love to hear the kind of frustration that they, but that was never looked at because they were just looked at as not cheating anymore. They were looked at as cheating and then not cheating. I looked at them as problem solving and then not problem solving. And so what we have is we have a society that all too often 
values the rule and the, the uh, compliance to it over the solution of the problem. And getting back to like the biting your nails thing, like, so I say, I don't want you biting your nails. And so I impose a penalty. When I catch you biting your nails, you're going to pay some sort of penalty, whatever it is. And so what happens is my enforcement is not consistent. My, my enforcement is not, not reliable. So what, what I mean by that is you bite your nails and get away with it to a certain extent. You bite your nails and get away with it. And so what happens then since, since my enforcement is not consistent, I think, okay, what if I up the penalty? I'll increase the penalty for it. And so now I increase the penalty for it. And that still doesn't stop you from biting your nails. So now I employ someone else and I say, you keep an eye on them so that we can do a better job being more consistent at catching you biting your nails. So it's more consistent in terms of catching you, but you still get away with it sometimes. And so now we increase the penalty further. And now we've reached a point where this is getting out of hand because the penalty is excessive. The penalty is severe. The penalty is, is very much out of alignment with what's happening because the thing that's being valued is you don't bite your nails. The things the thing that's not being addressed is why you bite your nails. We've at no point in this process tried to figure out why you bite your nails and what could actually cause you to stop or whether that's even important. Cause maybe that's just not even important. Maybe we could just let it go, but let's assume it was important. How do we actually get there? Cause we're not going to get there by stiffer and stiffer penalties. And we'll get to that with the law of Moses basically had as stiff a penalty as you could have for everything. So if stiffer penalties solve the problems, why aren't we still killing people for being rebellious to parents? Why aren't we killing people for everything that they do wrong? I mean, if the stiffer penalty actually produced the, the functional society and that's what we should be looking at when we look at these things, we should be looking at how it didn't work. It was a failure. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. It didn't produce a functional society. It, produ it produced a bloodthirsty society that valued rules above people having food when they were needy. It, it produced a mentality where religious rituals were more important than the well-being of people. And so... It completely ends up, it's what it always does. Law always ends up being a perversion of itself that ends up making the compliance to the rules the important thing rather than the, the solution to the problem it was supposed to be solving in the first place. It was supposed to be solving a problem, and it didn't. It didn't solve a problem. So what you said was, we need more enforcement, we need stiffer punishment, we need more enforcement, we need stiffer punishment, and all along the way, all it's doing is producing a, a growing feeling of bitterness and and resentment and it ends up with pushback so at some point i'm gonna have a stiff enough penalty and a person watching you all the time to the point that you say you know i've had enough of this shit i'm not putting up with it anymore you just obviously don't even care about me i'm gonna you know see you later and that's gonna be the pushback at some point it's gonna create that enmity it's gonna create that that tension between the one side and the other. And that's what always happens is as the intensity of enforcement increases is it builds that intensity of hatred between, between the two parties, between the two forces involved. Because at no point does the one party ever say to the other, let's look at why this is happening. Let's look at what's going on here that's creating this situation and let's, let's look at what will actually solve it because what's not going to solve it is punishment. And so I don't by any means think that God is so stupid that he thinks that 
forcible, punitive, harsh punishment produces an, a desired behavior. What I think he does think is that being loved and knowing your value and knowing the value of others is what produces that. And that's what the grace message is really about. The grace message is about saying that you are valued. You are beloved. You are treasured to God and in God's eyes. And that we're the ones who think otherwise. And he's, he's, he's looking at you saying, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I'm well pleased. And we're going, yeah, I don't think so. You know, whether it's ourself or others, we're, we're looking at and saying that doesn't look, that doesn't look like something worthy to me. God looks at everything and he says, it's very good. It's exactly the way I made it. I'm patting myself on the back. You're my beloved treasure. And we don't see it that way. And that's that's us out of alignment. And so if we look at the law of Moses, we see an attempt to control behavior and like we're going to have this beautifully functional society, the, the perfect utopia, if we just have a violent enough attack against, against these misdeeds. And so first we look at Deuteronomy 19, and it says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those gates in those days and the judges shall make diligent inquisition and behold if the witness be false witness and has testified falsely against his brother then you shall do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother so shall you put the evil away from among you and those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you so here it is it's saying if you intended to do wrong against someone and someone find and we find out about it then we should do what we should do to you what you intended to do to someone else that's the opposite of the golden rule that's the opposite of do unto others as you would have them do unto you that's do unto others as they have planned to do unto you um but here it says that by doing this it'll put the evil away from you and then those witnesses this is going to be a measure that keeps people from doing this thing because they're going to see how this punishment takes place and they're going to they're going to restrain themselves from doing this sort of things because they're going to be afraid that this might this kind of punishment might happen to them. And then we see again it says if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him unto the elders of the city and into the gate of his place and they shall say unto the elders of his city our son is stubborn and rebellious he will not obey our voice he is a glutton and a drunkard and all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die so shall thou put away evil from among you and all israel shall hear and fear so here it is again, this principle that if you have a violent enough punishment for something, people are going to abstain from doing it. So all you need is a stiff enough punishment, and in this case, stoning people until they're dead. And now you're going to have this, you're going to, as it says, put evil away from among you. That's, that is a way of saying, you're not going to have this problem. This problem won't exist as long as you kill people for doing it. So really, I mean, if we want to have people stop driving while drunk, we should just murder them when, when they do it. You know, we, we catch you in a DUI, we'll just kill you. And then, you know, then that problem won't exist anymore. I mean, am I the only one that thinks what kind of bullshit fairy tale is it that violence solves your problems? I mean, because it's a, it's a complete work of fiction that all you need is severe enough violence against transgressors, and then all your problems are going to be solved. But that's exactly what religion presents. Like, God has this intolerance for certain behaviors, and instead of trying to figure out what the root cause of that problem is, he just wants to take out anybody that breaks the rules.
the, that's where this concept of like die and go to heaven or die and go to hell comes from is that God's going to, you're going to die and stand before God and he's going to be, and he's going to say, well, you broke the rules. So I have no tolerance for you. I want nothing to do with you and I'm going to destroy you. And so then I'm going to have my perfect utopian society where we have no rule breakers and we have nobody that ever makes a mistake and we have nobody who ever gets anything wrong or disagrees about anything. Like God is just like, you know, you shut up and you do what you're told and you pay the price. And that's a satanic deity right there. There's nothing, there's no love in that. There's no kindness in that. There's no joy in that. And if that's really what happens when you die, then no thanks. I'll pass. How do I get to stay the hell away from you? I mean, so that's why, why do you think people are atheists? Because that's what's presented to them is this God that hates them and at best is willing to pre pretend that he likes them. I mean, but the, that's not at all what God is like. So now we look at Numbers chapter 15. It says, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in word because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses that the man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. So now let's look at what grace preaches. And we go to 1 Corinthians 1 and it says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that... Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, and things which are despised, has God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. So the foolishness of God is the idea that says you don't produce the behavior you want by making a law and creating stiffer and stiffer penalties. You create it by instilling in people an identity that they are loved and they are valued and that they are equal with one another. And so that's foolishness to the world. The world thinks you need stiffer penalties. You need more enforcement. Let's add another law. Let's refine this law. The world thinks that law is wisdom. God understands that law is foolishness. And so, if stiffer penalties and more punitive enforcement was really going to solve the problem, then it seems like they would have probably had the ideal society there in the time of Moses. And if God thought that it was wisdom to enforce violent retribution against people for committing wrongdoing then I don't see how this passage could exist. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. 
For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The wisdom of God is peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy. I suggest to you that there's no wisdom in stoning people to death. There's no wisdom in thinking that if someone intends to do you harm, just do the harm they intended to do to you and make sure there's witnesses so that they'll think twice about doing such themselves. If the wisdom from above is peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated and full of mercy, then perhaps that is the reason why it seems like foolishness to the world. Because one thing I've noticed is religion seems to like to make it seem like if you thought it through and it made sense to you, then it's probably the wrong doctrine. The devil probably told you. And if you thought it through and it's completely nonsensical and stupid, then that probably is the wisdom of God. No, what it's talking about is this concept of you are what you do and your value is how well you do it. And we have rules and what's important to us is that you keep those rules. Versus you are in the likeness and image of God who made you and who is very pleased with you. And your value is equal to everyone else. All people are created equal. And your value is infinite. And God sees you as his beloved, selected, precious treasure above all else. That's what's foolishness to the world. 